The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times, and uh, joined on this episode by Florina Altschiller. She's the lead trial attorney for the law firm Russo & Gould. She's a legal analyst who you've seen on WKBW and networks across the country. She's a former sex crimes prosecutor for the state of Alaska where she uh, handled felony level crimes against children, including homicides. Uh, And she's an adjunct professor at Columbia and the University of Buffalo. Florina, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time uh, that I've wanted to have you on the show to talk about, well, who knows what, some uh, legal aspect of what's going on in sport, whether it be locally, whether it be nationally. And um, unfortunately, this first one is about something that hits close to home, and it's incredibly serious. Um, the Matt Areza case, he's the Buffalo Bills rookie punter who they cut on Saturday, two days after a civil lawsuit was filed in California that accused him of participating in a gang rape, um, false imprisonment, gender violence crimes uh, against a 17-year-old accuser. Uh, he denies these charges. I should say that up front. Um, but there's been a lot of confusion by myself included. Uh, I'm a sports reporter and unfortunately in my 30 years of covering sports, I have to cover legal issues a lot, business transactions, things like that, things that have nothing to do with games or practices or championships. Uh, so, uh, I think that one of the most common questions, Florina, regarding this case from Bill's fans in particular, why? Would there be a civil case filed before the police and the district attorney have gone through their process? Uh, And does and I think that there are a lot of people who saw that as a red flag that this is a money grab. But Dan Galeo, the attorney for the accuser, explained it in a tweet uh, a couple of days ago. What's your take on how this has been filed? So when it comes to professional athletes, there's actually not just two avenues, but three avenues that um, need to be considered. So you have a potential civil lawsuit or you have a filed civil lawsuit. You have a potential criminal case, which here is yet to be determined. And additionally, what you have is the leagues, the NFL's personal conduct policy that comes into play, which allows suspension or cutting of players. And that right there um, is very open and broad. It covers actions um, that really are unbecoming of somebody that is playing for the league. So here, what we have happening is him being cut by the league before him being found guilty of any criminal wrongdoing or any resolution of a civil lawsuit. So that's one avenue is the league or the team saying, we don't agree with just the accusations being made against you because it's a distraction, because it's not something we want our players to have. And so it's in violation of the conduct policy of the league. You're cut. Next, we separately have the civil lawsuit. And a civil lawsuit is always, in every single case, a question of money. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what the the accuser's attorney is saying about pursuing justice or doing the right thing. Every single civil lawsuit that has ever been filed in the history of civil lawsuits is about money. 
It is about moving money from the hands that have it to the hands that don't. That's what a civil lawsuit is. And if the accuser's attorney is successful and is able to convince a jury or the other attorneys to settle, but either way, if they're able to prevail on the civil claims, then the end result is they will be entitled to money damages. Now, separately, the third avenue, and that's the big question mark here, is the criminal process. Now, all three of these avenues function in parallel. One does not necessarily preclude the other, and one does not necessarily come before the other. The criminal avenue really is the hardest avenue in which to prevail because the burden of proof is different. So we're talking about beyond a reasonable doubt versus in a civil case where we're talking about by a preponderance of the evidence, which is more likely than not, or to put it real simply, 51%. That's all that needs to be proven in a civil case. In a criminal case, it's a really high burden. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And in a criminal case, it is the government, or here, the people of the state of California, against the criminal defendant. And it is up to the district attorney's office, in this case, the San Diego district attorney's office, to make a determination whether or not there is sufficient evidence to prove these charges against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a high burden. And as of today, the district attorney's office is not yet decided whether or not they're going to be pressing charges. I find that concerning. Um, I think it questions the validity of the claims, to be quite frank. Uh, they've had 10 months. They had a recorded uh, planted phone call between the accuser and this potential criminal defendant. Um, they've had access to witness statements, witness interviews, cell phone footage, they have subpoena power, they have the power of the San Diego Police Department to obtain and secure any and all evidence that may potentially be relevant. And now we've had 10 months of time pass and the district attorney's office has not taken any action and does not have a timeline of when they may take any action if they will. I'm certain that they want to be thorough. I'm certain that they don't want to rush to judgment and, you know, file these charges. But at the same time, as somebody who has prosecuted sex crimes, I can tell you that we know pretty quickly whether or not the accusations are ones that may be supported by the evidence or not. And if they're not supported by the evidence or if there's not sufficient evidence to support those charges, then we don't file charges because the last thing we want to do is try to convict an innocent person of a crime that they did not commit. For timeline purposes, uh, the attorney for Matt Ariza, Carrie Armstrong, told me that he was hired about six weeks ago and that the San Diego Police Department did not reach out to Matt Ariza to talk to him about this until after the attorney had been hired. So it was relatively recently that the police department had bothered to reach out to Ariza to invest or to interview him, according to his attorney. And then uh, the San Diego police department just recently, uh, just last week, turned over its findings to the district attorney's office. So I just wanted to, to maybe uh, clarify between the police having held on to this for 10 months versus and just giving it to the district attorney versus the concept that maybe the district attorney has been holding on to it for a while. Is there a difference there? Generally, police departments work in tandem with the district attorney's office and generally with high exposure cases like sex crimes or homicides. There is somebody from the district attorney's office that is coordinating the efforts of the police department. I could tell you that when I was a district attorney, I would work hand in hand with the detectives before any charges would be filed. And I would help guide where that investigation goes. Sometimes we would charge by indictment. So the person would not even be arrested until after we filed that indictment and a grand jury had determined that there was sufficient evidence. Other times a decision would be made to arrest first. Um, but to say that there's no involvement with the district attorney's office before the case is handed over in full 
is not necessarily at all times accurate. I have no inside knowledge into the San Diego District Attorney's Office. And so I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and guess how they function, but as a large city DA's office, generally speaking, with higher exposure cases, there is involvement from the DA's office with the police department, and they're just not out there running like lone wolves. Once they hand over the file, what they're saying is their investigation is now complete, and now it's fully in the hands of the DA's office. The other thing that I will say is the attempt to contact the defendant um, really would not lead to all that much. There's two questions in any sex crimes case. The first question is whether or not sex occurred. The next question is whether or not that sex was consensual. And so here, my understanding is there really is no question about whether or not sex occurred because there's a recorded statement between the accuser and the defendant where he admits having sex with her. And so that hurdle is passed, right? We, we know from that admission that he made that sex occurred. Having sex is not a crime. Having sex without consent is. Now we also know that she's under the age of 18, which in California makes her a minor not capable of consent. There is a gray area based on the defendant's age. And in California, there's also a gray area based on what the defendant knew or perceived her age to be, which is much different than the law in New York, where it does not matter what the defendant believed the accuser's age to be. It's essentially strict liability in New York. In New York, whatever the age is, that's what the age is, and it's open and shut. In California, there's a gray area for what he believed her age to be. And so my suspicion is that the DA's office has not made a decision because it's not entirely clear whether there's sufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the actions were without consent. And so that's the big question mark for the criminal case. And they may well have enough evidence to support that this was without, without consent. Um, I understand that there's evidence that she had been drinking and that she was intoxicated. But having sex after having a couple of drinks is also not a crime. If she's unconscious, absolutely that's a crime and that's without consent. If she's passed out, that's a different story. If she is so drunk that she's not capable of consenting, sure, that would make it a crime. But if there are other people at this party who saw her, who saw her speaking coherently, who saw her walking unassisted, who saw her making clear conscious decisions, then that really raises a question about whether or not she was so intoxicated that she was not capable of consent. And so for criminal purposes, I think there's going to be a lot of gray here. And that's that's the hesitation, that's the hang up, and that's why it's taking time. You mentioned some of the things that are in the civil suit, some of the details. Um, you know, can we assume that everything that the uh, the attorney is alleging in the civil suit is true and that happened specifically maybe the what was said on that phone call? Because it's not that it hasn't been admitted in court quite yet. So is there any possibility that some of these details that we've learned about and maybe taken for granted that they actually happened, happened a different way? Jonah, that is a great question, right? Um, what we know is what the plaintiffs, she's a civil plaintiff now, right? What her attorney wants us to know and, and their side of the story, essentially. Um, an attorney has an obligation to, in good faith, put forward facts that they believe to be true. So I have no reason to believe that her attorney is putting forward false facts. That being said, there's definitely different ways of looking at those facts. There's definitely potential additional facts that are not included in the accusations that her civil attorney who is suing for money damages has put forward. And we have not heard anything from the defense side here yet. We haven't even heard anything from the police department or the district attorney's office 
other than for them to say that they are still investigating or looking into this. And so, of course, there's more facts. There's always more facts. I, when I teach trial advocacy, I love telling students that there is no one correct answer and it is not a question of the truth. You have one side who's selling one version of the facts and you have opposing side selling the other version of the facts. The truth is somewhere in between. And ultimately, we never get to the truth because so much evidence is also never revealed, never shared, um, irrelevant, not admissible. And so a conclusion that we come to is whether or not the facts match the law from the limited amount of facts that we see and from a spin by two different sides of those facts. Florina, I, I think this is an opportunity to, uh, because I think that when something uh, like this happens, as unfortunate as it is, uh, there's an audience that maybe hasn't thought about this uh, before. Uh, this is something that the Buffalo Bills haven't faced. And so you have an entire fan base. Uh, and even beyond that, you know, people who are paying attention to this, trying to read the tea leaves, um, as we started this discussion out with. Why was the civil suit filed and before the district attorney had made a decision yet? Why isn't there a, an a open and shut case because she's 17 years old? You know, there's a lot of different things that people are wondering. I guess in a very general sense, not specific to this case, what is important or what do you think is significant that we learn from this as we absorb the information that's coming? And that means whether it be empathy towards the accuser or empathy towards the uh, the accused in how we how we handle the way that we deliberate this as a public well as i started off saying there's three different systems at play here um, and really we have different burdens of proof we have different standards and we have different avenues of what the goal from that avenue is essentially. Sex crimes are very serious allegations with very serious outcomes. Anybody who believes that they were sexually assaulted, in my opinion, was sexually assaulted. If you think that you were taken advantage of, then you were taken advantage of and you have emotional trauma um, and there are services that you may need for the rest of your life to deal with that sort of trauma. That's from a basic psychology perspective. That is not the legal system, however, right? Um, somebody who believes that they were sexually assaulted may not have necessarily been a victim of rape in a criminal sense because there are very specific elements of that crime that need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is a high hurdle to pass. Somebody who believes that they were sexually assaulted may be able to recover money damages, even if there is no crime that was committed because civil cases are a lower burden of proof. Also, somebody who maybe does not prevail in a civil lawsuit could still receive some sort of justice or vindication if the person who committed um, those acts against them is a person in power or a person with money or an NFL player, because at the end, they may still end up losing their entire career as a result of those allegations. Or if we look at what happens so often on college campuses, where one student accuses another one of sexual misconduct. And as a result, whether or not there's a civil lawsuit, whether or not there's a criminal case filed, there's going to be a disciplinary hearing at that school. And the other student who's accused of sexual misconduct may very well lose their scholarship, be suspended from the university, or be expelled from the university. And so as a now defense attorney, my concern really is one of due process and one of protections afforded to people who are being accused because these are very serious allegations and the other person's life is literally on the line here. And if the person is correct and if the accusations are founded, 
if they're supported by the evidence, if the person that is accused actually committed the crime of rape, then absolutely they should be held accountable and they should be subject to the penalties that our criminal justice system affords. Uh, they should lose their career. Um, th there really is no, no way of making the victim whole again. But we have to consider the flip side of this. And the flip side is, what if these accusations do not amount to what would be rape? What if these accusations are not a crime? What if these accusations don't result in what would be sufficient to even hold him civilly liable for money damages? We're talking about a young man whose career is now over as a result of accusations being made. And if these accusations are supported, he absolutely deserves to have his career end. But what if they're not? Is anybody pausing to think, what if these accusations lack merit? Because all we hear, as, as Jonah pointed out in asking, you know, what, what's the other side of this? All that we hear is the one version of what the accuser's attorney is selectively sharing with us and with the public through the media. And it's, it's very unfortunate and very sad because I've represented many young men through proceedings where at the end of the day, they were vindicated, but they don't get their time back. They don't get their scholarship back. They can come back to school a year later having missed a year of school. And, and it's problematic and you can't unring that bell and you can't give back that time. And I'm certainly not in a position to stand here and tell you that he's innocent. But what I'm saying is we don't know. We don't have the full story. What we have is an accusation and we have swift action and we have criticism, in fact, that the action wasn't swift enough, that he should have been released earlier. And that's a penalty that you can't take back. Uh, Florina, let me ask about the Buffalo Bills decision not to reach out to the accuser after the accuser's attorney contacted them on July 31st. It is something that we saw it with the Deshaun Watson case. Uh, we've seen it with a lot of high profile cases in sports um, where the team doesn't care to hear the accuser's side. Maybe there's a legal reason for that, or maybe uh, but anyways, I, I think it's interesting because they get to speak to Matt Ariza face to face and look him in the eye and ask him, did you do it? To which there's a certain power and, and but a, probably an inherent bias to that versus a, a declining to then do the same with the other side. As common as that is, is that proper procedure or is that what what should have been done there, do you think? Look, sports teams and their lawyers are not in a position to conduct criminal investigations. Uh, we have police departments and law enforcement for a reason, and it is their job to properly investigate these types of cases. So did an attorney who works for the bills, whose job it is to review contract terms, and whose legal understanding is not at all sex crime related, should that attorney have interviewed a victim of a sex crime? I really don't think so. I don't think that would have yielded any different result. And I actually think that it could have resulted in something far worse. I think somebody who is not experienced in handling these types of allegations, which what sports team attorney is, right? They don't have the volume of sex crimes that law enforcement deals with or that a local DA's office deals with. I think that that attorney could have potentially re-traumatized the accuser. I think that attorney could have potentially asked some uh, concerning and offensive leading questions that would have re-victimized the accuser. And I think potentially that it could have been far worse backlash with uh, media reports of that attorney, you know, accusing the victim of being a liar or suggesting that this is a fabrication. But let me tell you, those are avenues that need to be pursued in any good investigation, but delicately so by somebody who knows how to do that. And I really don't think that any um, sports team 
whether it's their attorneys or their management is in a position to do that appropriately. And so them not doing that is not at all a red flag, but actually I think the appropriate thing to do uh, because they know that it's in the hands of law enforcement and they know that law enforcement is investigating it. And so to rely on them to do it is the right thing to do. It's almost like saying you see somebody with, um, with a fracture on the side of the road, why didn't you make a cast for them? Well, I don't know, maybe you could grab a shirt and create a wrap, but you're not a physician and you're probably going to cause more damage than good if you're trying to create a cast on the side of a road for an injured person, or if you're going to try to perform surgery with a pen and a keychain. Um, that's not the thing to do, that's not your specialty. And a lot of times when you try to do that, you're going to make the problem worse, not better. Do you think the criticism that the bills have faced for not acting on this swift enough, not investigating and making a decision soon after they learned about the accusations or even learning about this in the draft process and knowing uh, maybe not to draft this individual because of that case? Has that been fair that the bills didn't do their due diligence quick enough? You know, we don't know how much they knew or didn't know. Uh, we don't know what he told them or if he spoke to them or whether he had an attorney um, at the time and chose not to tell them information about an ongoing investigation, which would absolutely be in his right to do. So, you know, there's this broad definition that covers ongoing legal matters that allows a team to go ahead and suspend or even cut a player so long as they're violating this personal conduct policy. So could they have cut him loose earlier uh, because of this conduct being in violation of their policy? Absolutely. But if we look at it hyper-technically, really, it includes ongoing legal matters. And depending on how you interpret that, the lawsuit had not yet been filed. We know there were no criminal charges filed. And so is the threat of a lawsuit technically an ongoing legal matter? Well, I guess it depends. And it could be interpreted either way. And what we do know is once the lawsuit was filed, they did take swift action under this personal conduct policy. Could they have taken action earlier? Sure. But you also have to consider his rights. And if they took action too soon and cut him too quickly, he could potentially sue them for violating his contract and for you know, causing him millions of dollars in loss if they were wrong. So it's not something that you want them to do all that quickly because we have to think about both sides here. And the other side of this is we have a young man who has a $3.9 million contract who stands to lose his entire career and a lot of money based on what an attorney who's suing for money damages is telling them in an attempt to potentially secure a pre-suit settlement. And so those are the things that they have to consider in making their decision. And what you don't want happening is you don't want teams cutting players immediately because somebody said that something happened at one point in time. Yeah, I think where a lot of people are uh, upset, at least the Bills fans who were upset at the team, uh, was their comment or their statement in which they said that they had conducted a thorough examination, which then created a situation where 24 hours or 48 hours later, uh, it was revealed that they were caught by surprise uh, regarding a lot of the things that were in the civil lawsuit. So how thorough could the examination have been? I guess to a certain point, uh, it was thorough. Uh, and that's where the general manager, Brandon Bean, said on Saturday at his news conference, we should have set an ongoing investigation or we shouldn't have done that. And then, again, from a an anecdotal standpoint, the release of the other punter who was in competition with Matt Ariza, Matt Hawk, was kind of a perceived stamp of approval that we've, we've, we've done everything we need to do and we've learned we're, this guy's okay. Uh, it's a stamp of approval. And then within the span of just a few days, it all fell apart. 
Yeah. And like I said earlier, I really don't think that they are in a position to be able to conduct what would be a thorough investigation. Um, but is it fair to mince words and to, uh, you know, to hold them responsible for maybe misstating what should have been an ongoing investigation or really what I think they should have said is we're going to defer to law enforcement who is conducting an investigation, and we're going to defer to their findings. Uh, that, that would have been the appropriate way to address it, in my opinion. So we're getting legal advice and PR advice here uh, from Florina Altschiller. Uh, Jonah, I know you wanted to ask about San Diego State's handling of this as, a, as kind of Pontius Pilate. Yeah, I did want to get uh, Florina's take on how the university, San Diego State University, but really any college, what, what is their responsibility to do conduct their own Title IX investigation and participate in the criminal investigation? And does it complicate things because the victim was not a student at San Diego State at the time? Well, not only was the student not, was the accuser not a student, but also my understanding is the allegation is that this happened at an off-campus private home. So this is not something that happened on campus. And none of the three men who are accused of these charges are currently students still at San Diego, right? Is my understanding? One player was on the team up until a couple of days ago. So uh, they have an obligation to look into this and they have an obligation to report their findings if there's a potential ongoing concern for the campus community. So if this happened on campus, that would trigger that obligation. If the accuser is a current student, that would trigger the investigation. If the person who's being accused is a current student, that potentially could trigger an, an investigation. And I say potentially because really, if a student commits a crime off campus and the victim is not a student, the university is not going to be investigating whether or not their student, you know, robbed somebody at tops or you know stole a car that's just well outside of what the university can investigate so the only time they do investigate is if it's something that either happened on campus or involves another student who's the supposed victim here so in this case i don't see what the university really can be doing and again we have capable law enforcement in every municipality in this country, whose job it is to investigate these cases. Now, do they do a great job? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but I could tell you with absolute certainty they do a much better job than people who are not trained in law enforcement, like university administrators or football team managers, whose job it, it isn't to investigate these types of allegations. So, Law enforcement has subpoena power. Law enforcement has investigatory power. Law enforcement has the personnel, the detectives to send out there and to interview people. And they have the ability to make people either speak to them or get an attorney and not speak to them. But they have the resources to actually conduct what would be a thorough investigation here. And does Matter Riza have any legal culpability because as i believe i read this was his house that he was renting and he was i guess you could say the host of the party so interestingly for civil liability purposes right because this happened in a home that he was renting potentially there may be insurance money um whether it's a renter's policy or a homeowner's policy or liability policy but there may be money that is available to recover for negligence, apart from any assault and battery type claims, but in allowing this to happen or in not doing what a reasonable person would have done, which is perhaps not invite high school students over and offer them alcohol. So there is a lot of room for civil liability for money damages here, which is why we see a civil lawsuit filed. But that does not mean that he is a rapist. It does not mean that he is criminally responsible for rape. Uh, but it may mean that she can still recover money for what happened. 
Florina Altschiller, the lead trial attorney with Russo and Gould, based here in Buffalo. Um, thank you for this. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you think is important to point out, Jermaine, to this subject or uh, enlightenment? So, in the age that we live in now with social media and with tweets and Instagram and news being delivered to you instantly on your phone, when attorneys share information and the public has access to it, I think there is often now a rush to judgment. And it is unfortunate because there are times, and I can't speak to Matt Ariza here, but there are times when people are accused of things that they did not do. And it is unfair to have that quick rush to judgment and to assume that when an accusation is made, that that other person is guilty of what they are accused of. They may very well be guilty, but let the process play itself out. Let the evidence come out. Let the other side have an opportunity to question witnesses and to put forth a defense before we go ahead as a society and convict people on accusations alone. That said, though, Florina, the bills were pretty handcuffed in this situation from a business standpoint, right? I mean, I don't want to, I mean, it, you do want to wait as a society, but the bills as a business don't have that luxury as they want this person on their team or don't want him on their team. And they're trying to win a Super Bowl and you only get so many chances. And that's also based on their code of conduct policy. And if there's a lawsuit pending against a player, that's absolute appropriate grounds to cut that player. And that's something that all players should know and understand when signing a contract is they really can't have these distractions around them. And from a PR perspective, the team doesn't want this distraction looming around the team. Very different process, though, than calling somebody a rapist or finding them criminally responsible before any criminal charges are even brought. Again, my thanks to Florina Altschiller, um, legal analyst. You've seen her on WKBW and, and networks across the country, former sex crimes prosecutor for the state of Alaska, and now currently working with the law firm of Russo and Gould. Florina, thank you for joining uh, the program and uh, for educating us. I feel as though you spoke to us in such a way, and long enough, by the way, we, we were here quite a bit, that I probably deserve or have earned some Columbia Law School credits. <laughs> well, Do you thank agree you. with that? I, I have no comment on that. I see. All right. That's, that's fair and wise. Based on the legal knowledge that I've just gleaned over the last 45 minutes, I will say that that's very wise for you to do that. Florina, thanks for doing this. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Thanks for having me, guys. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.